Good day, geometry students. Uh, this is Mr. Strickland coming to you on Sunday the 12th uh, in the afternoon. I don't know. What time is it? 4.30ish? Meh! I hope you guys had a happy Easter. Um, I hope the last four weeks have been going very well for you. I hope at the very least um, you've gotten in a little bit of rest, I hope. Um, the math team has been working really hard over the last few weeks, um, trying to bring continuous education into your home, uh, pretty much distant learning. Uh, we've talked quite a bit on what are the essential skills that we feel you need to learn. Um, we have a little over five weeks to go, so... We're going to take a break from triangles. We're leaving triangles behind for a little bit. We're going to start our new unit fresh with circles as our main topic. Now, circles are actually very interesting because they're probably not defined the way you think they're defined. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, I was out buying some essentials and trying to figure out what the heck did I want to do for dinner. So, with dinner and circles in mind, I decided... So, pizza just came out of the oven. I like it nice and crispy. Looks quite scrumptious. Um, so, as most of you know, most pizzas are actually in the shape of circles. And I do say most, because I know there's some out there that are rectangular for some reason. But most pizzas are in the shape of a circle. But what exactly is a circle? Well, the, the definition of a circle. A circle is the set of all points that are equidistant from a given center, from a given point. So when you define a circle... If this pepperoni is the center, the circle is defined as every point that is equidistant from that center. So the circle is defined, here's the edge of it, the outside of my circle, the set of all points equidistant from that center. So when you cut pizza, you're not, you don't cut pizza off to the side like this. What kind of heathen would cut pizza like that? No, when you cut pizza, you want each slice to be about the same size. So when you cut pizza, the very first slice is usually, and I mean people have their own personal technique, I know, but the first slice, the first cut, is all the way through the center, cutting it in half. This is known as a diameter. A diameter is the line segment that goes through the center of the circle. It cuts it in half. Come on, pizza, stop being a pain. Yes, okay. Got it, maybe? Mm, yes, there we go. So this beautiful straight line, this segment, is known as a diameter. A radius. When you go from the center of the circle to the outside, that is what's known as the radius of a circle. A radius is a line segment. You see this beautiful line right here? A radius is a line segment where the endpoints are on the circle. So remember, all points equidistant from the center. So one endpoint is on the circle. The other endpoint is the center, the center of the pizza. This is your radius right here. Now you may notice there is no crust on my pizza. A uh, little bummed about that actually because Oh man, I love that cheesy stuffed crust pizza. Mmm. If there were a crust on this pizza, unfortunately Walmart was out. This was the only pizza that they had. But if there was a crust, the crust is on the outside of the pizza. 
Well, the term for that is circumference. The distance around the outside of the circle, the distance around the outside is known as the circumference of a circle. Um, I think that's all I wanted to share right now, um, cause it's dinner time. Okay, so before I consume this delicious looking pizza, um, there's actually a couple more definitions that I wanted to share with you. Man, who know there were so many definitions that came with a pizza. Anyways, um, first off, area of a circle. Area of a circle is defined as pi times the radius squared. Again, the radius is from the center point to the point on the outside. So the area of the circle is essentially the eating space of the pizza. And I mean, I know the toppings make it three dimensional, but remember area is, in di is two dimensional. So if this is pi r squared, I happen to know that this diameter is 16 inches. Therefore, the area of this circle, well, radius is half of the diameter. So this radius is eight inches. So the area of this pizza is eight squared, so 64 times pi inches squared. So the area of the pizza, all this goodies that I'm going to eat, is the area in inches squared. And when you cut pizza into slices like this, well, this is a piece of a circle. This is a fourth of a circle because I'm cutting this pizza into fourths. When you have a piece of a circle, that is known as a sector. So I will take the pi r squared for the whole circle and then take a fourth of it since that's how I like to do my slices. A slice of pizza is known as a sector. Well, hello everyone, Mr. Florence here. Hope you're doing okay. Welcome back to school. We're doing circles first here in geometry. Uh, we got some, a few weeks to do a few things. We're gonna do circles first. And then the second thing we're gonna do is three dimensions. So kind of two more units we're gonna cover. Um, we'll try to bring some triangles into here, but we're going to pretty much leave triangles behind. So, um, this, I know, I know you're sad. We've been doing triangles all year long, but that's the way it is. Circles are next. One of the other basic geometric figures. So getting on with circle definitions here. Um, these are the definitions you'll need to know. So what is a circle? What's the center of a circle? What's the radius? What is a radius? What's a chord? What's a diameter? And what's the diameter? What is a tangent line? What's a secant line? What's a central angle? What's an arc and what's a sector? That's everything you're gonna to need to know for now. Um, so getting right on with it, definition of a circle. When I ask people what the definition of a circle is, most people will say, oh, it's something with 360 degrees. But if I take a, some point and I draw a square around that point, so gosh, hard to draw a square, um, then I could start, say, over here, and I could go up a certain angle, go up 45 degrees, go up 90 degrees, go up 180 degrees. All of these angles, all the way around, I would get to 360 degrees again. I could go all the way around and make that square. The point is, though, if I go over here and up here, those distances in the square are going to be different. And here, the distance from this point and the distance from this point to that point are the same. This distance and this distance are congruent. And by the same token, every single distance from this point to there, and from this point to there, and from this point to there, all of these distances are the same. This point, this point, this point, this point, this point, every single point up here and all the points in between, start filling in them all in between, and you start to get a circle. That's the definition of a circle, and that's why the definition works. Which, with that being the definition of a circle, leads to some weird things. Down below, down here, here's 
di it's a couple diagrams. Diagram number one, diagram number two, and diagram number three. How many circles are there? Well, there's really just two. The first one here, all of these, let me get a different color. So all these blue points that are drawn on here are the same distance from some point down here. Right, all these distances are the same. Here, we didn't actually draw the circle. This is just the inside, the interior of the circle. So this doesn't really have a circle on it, even though, yes, of course, everybody calls that a circle. I do too, and I will, it's, it's not a problem to call that a circle. But frequently when you want to talk about a circle in a technical way, you have to know the technical definition. And the interior of a circle is different than the circle itself. So over here, number three, the interior is not drawn, but the circle itself out here, the circle is drawn. So this is a circle, this is a circle, and yeah, we all we all call this a circle, and of course it's a circle, but technically, I don't know, it, it's not really a circle. So that's what a circle is. The point that's in the center of a circle, that's called the center of the circle. So this would be circle centered at A. If I had a different circle over here, with its center was called, say, letter Q, then if I just stood back here and said, hey, look at this circle, you wouldn't know which one I'm talking about. But if I want to talk about circle A, a little O with a dot in it means circle. Circle A means we're talking about this circle. And that distance, remember that the circle is defined by all these points, E, H, F, all the points in between E and H, and all the points in between H and F, and G, B, C, D, all the points around here. That's what defines the circle. And the center of the circle is A, and the distance from the center to a point on the circle, well, that's the radius. Hopefully you know that. Hopefully you also know diameter. So the diameter, looking over here, would be like this, going from V to P, right? That's a diameter. Everybody knows that's a diameter. Hopefully everybody knows that's a diameter, because that's something you should definitely know from way back when. But if you don't, here's the technical difference for a diameter. Before you can talk about diameter, you should really talk about learning it technically. You should talk about a chord. So a chord is a segment that has one endpoint on a circle and another endpoint on a circle. So DE is that segment. Segment DE is a chord. Two endpoints on the circle. And DF and DG are also chords. HC, HB, HG are all chords. Over here, NW is a chord, DV is a chord. Notice NW is shorter than DV. OU goes right through the center, goes right through M, which means it's a diameter. A diameter is a chord that goes through a center. So I hope that's clear. Um, a chord is a segment with both endpoints on the circle, not inside or outside the circle, and a diameter is a chord that goes through the center. Now tangents and secants most people haven't heard of. Uh, a lot of you have heard of SOHCAHTOA and that is the sine, cosine, and tangent. Well sine, cosine, and tangent have to do with this but it's a kind of different idea here. Tangent here is not the tangent of an angle. This is the tangent to a circle and the tangent to a circle is a line like this line here like line TI so TI, this line, line TI is tangent to circle C because it only hits at point T. Whereas line SN hits at two points. Therefore line SN is a secant line. And notice the secant line, when you draw a secant line, draw that line in there, it does go from S to N, right? The part of the secant line inside is a chord. Notice that? So a secant line contains a chord. A uh, secant line intersects a circle in two spots. Tangent line does not contain a chord. Tangent line only intersects a circle at one point. And there's a lot of interesting stuff the way like this tangent line TI and this other tangent line LI 
the way those two lines interact and say these distances here are going to be congruent. And there's a lot of things like that. And we're not going to focus a lot on that this year. Uh, we're trying to pare down the curriculum for this at-home study and the continuous learning model. So we're, we're not going to cover everything we normally would. But there's a lot of things about these distances and how these lines interact with the circle that's very important when we study these things. So you can imagine this being the solar system and this being, say, a meteor, or excuse me, not a meteor, the solar system, but say an asteroid or a comet or something coming through. Or you can talk about these distances and if this is the Earth and this is a satellite, there's a lot of applications of this stuff. If this is a, a cup and this is some point outside the cup, you can figure things out with it. Um, but enough of that. Do you understand what a tangent and a secant are? A tangent is a line that hits in one spot. A secant is a line that hits in two spots. And moving on from there. Here's just a little aside about why the tangent is called a tangent. Um, you notice this tangent line? The dotted line is a tangent line. And no matter how I move this point around the circle, notice the point's moving around the circle. It's making this right triangle with the tangent line this angle down here, the central angle, changes as I move the tangent around. So the lengths involved in my triangle, T and H, are changing. Of course, the radius isn't going to change as my point moves around the circle. But T and H are both changing. So T is the distance from this point of tangency to the intercept, the intercept down here. And um, so little t is this distance. H is the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle. And we're going to say 1 is the radius of this circle. Well, if you look at the Sokotoa, remember Sokotoa, the tangent of the angle is the opposite over the adjacent. The hypotenuse doesn't come into play. So if the radius is 1, for a, this is called a unit circle, then the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. It's t over 1. This distance t along the tangent line is the tangent of this angle. So that's kind of one way how the tangent of an angle and the tangent line to a circle are related. The so central angles arc and sectors are parts of circles you need to know about also. And a central angle is pretty simple. It's an angle at the center of a circle. So for example, this angle here, angle M -R, excuse me, MHR, is a central angle. And hopefully that's pretty simple for you. Um, if you have two radii, then it's the angle between the two radii. That's a central angle. Um, a arc is the part of the circle. So this is part of the circle right here. And the arc is the part of the circle that's intercepted by the central angle. Meaning, intercepted means it's in between the two arms of the angle. So it's intercepted by it because it's in between it. It's captured by it like a football player intercepting a pass. An angle intercepting an arc is, it's catching it. So it's what's inside there. Um, and an arc, this would be, if I was to go from M to R on this circle, then this would be the way I'd want to do it most likely. Although going from M to R on the circle, I could go from M around this way to R also. And if I went all the way around the other way, that would be a much longer distance, but it's still going around part of the circle. So that, this would still be an arc, and it's going from M to R. So arc MR versus going from M to R the other way around. Notice what I'm doing here. I'm writing MR through I, and I'm putting an arc on it instead of, see, there's an arc. If I talked about segment MR, I'd be talking about the line that goes straight through from there to there. But since I've curved this symbol, it means I'm talking about the arc and not the segment. So this is notation. This is arc MR. If I want to go the long way around, I have to say go from M to R through I. So this would be a minor arc, the shortest way. And this would be a major arc going a long way around. If it's the same distance both ways, then the arc is a semicircle. Semi meaning half of a circle. So the arc is a semicircle. 
Over here, I'm going to give you just a few seconds. Can you recognize a major arc and a minor arc in this picture? Hopefully you did. The minor arc would be going from F to D or D to F. So that one right there is a minor arc and the major arc is going from D to F or F to D so I'll say I'm going from D to F but I have to go through something I have to go through I can't go through J I've got to go through K or L so I can say we'll go from D to F go through K that's the major arc or I can say go from D to F and go through L and that's the major arc. So minor arc, major arc, I hope that explains it to you. Then a sector is going to be the two-dimensional part of a circle. So let me erase some of this stuff over here and clean this up a little bit. The sector is this pie wedge. It looks like a triangle. If this side wasn't curved, it would be a triangle. If that was just a straight segment, instead of a curved arc, the RM, this would be a triangle. So it's a pie wedge. It's a piece of pizza. That kind of thing. That's what a sector looks like. Although over here, you can see between the two radii and the arc would be this area in here. And you can see it looks less like a pie wedge. So when they get really big, they can get to not look normal like a, this one over here is just a nice pie wedge. Matter of fact, if it's a major arc, if it's going from here around this way to get to here, if we're tracing between that arc, this radius, and this radius, then we're talking about this whole area here. All the light blue stuff. That being our sector. So sectors, you know, they're between, between a radius and another radius and an arc is the basic definition, two dimension. So now moving on, that is all of the definitions you really need to know about sectors, excuse me, about circles. So you, everything you need to know about circles, you can use these definitions to talk about it. We will talk more about things, of course, about area and circumference and things like that. But those are calculations you can make based on these numbers here. So I'll be here. So we'll, we'll talk about those calculations here next. And here we are with some measurements you can take in circles, some calculations you can do. The radius, again, we talked about the radius being both this segment as well as the length of this segment. So the, the radius of the circle is this length. This is a radius. We could draw another radius here and it would have the same length. So R would be the radius. So the radius is something you can measure. Um, you can measure a diameter also. You can measure this distance. So the length of the longest cord. You can see the cords get longer and longer and longer. And then as you draw cords down here, they'll get shorter and shorter and shorter. The longest one is the one that's going to go through the middle. And two radii going from the center to here. And then having one point in the exact opposite direction. One from the center to here. Two radii make a diameter. So you have this formula. A diameter is two radii. Moving on, the circumference is the distance around a circle, so it's basically the, like the perimeter for a, poly a polygon, the circumference of a circle, is the distance around a circle. And this is the circumference of a circle. This is an empirically derived formula, meaning they got it from experimentation. People started to notice that if you divide both sides by R, C over R, that always equals 2 pi. No matter how big your circle is, if it's a certain radius, it'll have a bigger bigger circumference. A, a bigger, a smaller radius, a smaller circumference. So, doesn't matter what your numbers are, this will always equal 2 pi. People notice that, and so this is the formula for circumference. Now, the area of a circle, you can prove this, but it gets to be pretty, pretty tough. Um, remember, it's two-dimensional. Here, you're taking a radius 
times basically six times as big, right? Pi is three point something. Two times three is six times this length. Here you're taking three times a length squared. You're doing a radius times a radius. And if you just did one r squared, you would get the area of this square. If you did another one, this r times this r, you would get this square. And if you do this r and this r, you get this square, and you could do another one, this r times this r to give you the area of this squared. If you had four r squared, it would be too big. Instead, you need smaller, you need around three. It's pi r squared is the area of the square. For arcs, there's two different measurements we can do. Well, there's a measure and there's a length. The measure is, well, how much of the circle does it go around? If it goes, if it goes around uh, 360 degrees, well, that's the whole circle. If it goes around 180 degrees, well, that's the half the circle. It doesn't matter how big the circle is. If it goes 180 degrees, it goes half the circle. So the measure of an arc doesn't matter how big the circle is. The measure of an arc is just the degrees it goes around. So if it goes 90 degrees, it's going a quarter of a circle. That's basically all it is. Whatever the central angle is, that is what the me whatever the central angle is, that is what the measure of the arc is. The length of an arc is actual distance. It's not measured in angles. You're not going 180 degrees. Instead, you're going some number of feet or inches or miles or kilometers or some kind of distance around there. And these are proportional. Don't memorize the formula. Memorize proportions. Use proportions. If you set up ratios, you got it. So the distance, or, the distance around the whole circle to the whole angle, right? This is the circumference here. The circumference to the whole angle equals your arc length to your angle measure. So if, you, if the angle is only part of the circle, the length is only going to be part of the circle. That's the length and the measure. They're going to be proportional to the length around the whole circle and the measure around the whole circle. So set up that proportion. Don't memorize the formula. Set up that proportion. Memorize this. Know what the length around the whole circle is. Memorize this. Know what the angle around the whole circle is, what the measure is. And they're proportional. Length of the arc to measure of the arc equals length of the circle to measure the circle. Same for the thing for the area of a sector. You're going to look at proportions again. So with proportions, the area of a sector is the area of the whole circle to the measure of the whole circle. That'll tell you the ratio. And then another ratio with the same thing, the area to the measure, the area of the sector to the measure of the sector. There you go. Area to angle equals area to angle. Just multiply by M and you'll have A. These are the calculations you need to do, measurements you need to be able to do. Um, not all of them will you be doing much of. The more common ones are the ones you're familiar with from, from uh, more elementary grades are these top four. Um, the ones about arcs and sectors, a little less common. But hey, this is geometry, moving to the big time. Moving on here. Okay, so here's an example of one kind of problem that we can solve using these basic definitions and basic calculations from this lesson. Um, Mary's riding a bike so that the wheels are spinning at 160 revolutions per minute. Well, if we knew how far her bike went in one revolution, then we could figure out how far it went in 160 revolutions, just converting the units. So that's the real key is how far does it go in one revolution? Well, one time around, the wheels are circular. If it goes around once, then the distance it goes around in one revolution is a circumference, which is going to be 2 pi times the radius. The circumference is 2 pi r. So the distance it's going to go around in one revolution, so per revolution, 
is 2 pi times 12 inches, right? The diameter is 24 inches, so the radius is 12 inches. 2 pi times 12 is 24 pi. And we'll just go ahead and approximate this. Uh, 24 times pi equals about 75.398. So approximately 75. What did I say it was? 75.398. So now we know it's 75. Again, that's per revolution, 0.398 inches per revolution in one revolution. And just converting units, we can get rid of revolutions. We know how many revolutions per minute it's been. Right? We said it was 160 revolutions per one minute. And if you look, we have revolutions down here in the denominator and up here in the numerator. So we're multiplying by revolutions and then dividing by revolutions. Those units are going to cancel out, just like if we had 2 divided by 2. So that calculation will give us a number of inches per minute. We take that number times 160 is what we have to do. So over here, times 160, we're getting, gosh, 12,063.716. 12063716. And if we, we can convert that, we can make it into feet per minute by putting inches in the denominator because inches here in the numerator. So if we know the conversion factor, which we do, there's one foot and 12 inches, then multiplying by inches and dividing by inches are going to cancel out. And this calculation will give us a number of feet per minute. We can make it feet per hour to get rid of minutes, we'll want to put the number of minutes in top and the number of hours in bottom. We know there are 60 minutes in one hour. And again, down here in the bottom we have minutes. And then over here in the top we have minutes. Those are going to cancel out when we do this calculation. So the units this will give us are number of feet per hour. And we can switch that to miles per hour too. We have feet in the numerator, we can put feet down here in the denominator. If we know the number of miles per foot, we can figure this out. So again, the reason we're putting the feet down in the denominator here is because feet down here and feet up here are going to cancel out. So let's see, there was one mile in 5,280 feet. 5,000, um, erase that. So 5,280 feet. That might not be a conversion you're real familiar with, but it's, it's a fairly common one. A lot of people know that. And so now again, there's no units here. All the units we have per hour, and it's miles. So that's going to give us miles per hour. So let's bring in the calculator and have it do the calculation for us. There's that number we need to do times 1 divided by 12 and times 60 divided by 1 and times 1 divided by 5,280. She's going about 11 and a half miles an hour. 11.4 miles per hour is how fast she's going. 
and just pretty simple ideas. I mean, you have to know how to do unit conversions to get miles per hour, but the ideas here are fairly simple. So I hope you, th I hope you agree, and I hope you can solve problems like this, and have fun doing your assignment. Your assignment is going to be to go look at circles and describe them, and let us know that you're looking at circles. Yum! Looks like this soup is almost ready. Wait a minute. This spoon reminds me of something. Hmm. A secant, that's what it is. I am mowing my lawn, and just another demonstration of circles and tangents to circles. Hopefully, you can see where it's been mowed. Underneath, let me unplug this because I'm going to go underneath where the blade is. Underneath, you can see that the blade spins this way. The sharp edge is over here and the dull side's over here. So on the other half of the blade, this is the sharp side and the dull side. So it always spins this way. And it's going to cut the grass from the center of the circle out to here as, it, as the edge of this goes around in a circle, right? If I spin my finger around my fingers going in a circle and because it spins out to here it creates a circle say right here and then instead of moving a line along I'm moving the circle along this line where the grass is cut don't know that you can see it very well maybe up here a little better this line where the grass is cut that's the line that would be tangent to the circle Okay, Marley's gonna help me measure her toy here, see how much room she needs to play on it. So if I'm measuring this, I would want to make sure that my tape measure goes through the center of the circle. So take a look at that diameter. And I can see that this is about a 15 inch diameter that we're working with here, right Marley? Um, if I'm thinking about a 15 inch diameter and I want to think about the area of this circle, then I would want to use the formula pi r squared, just like Mr. Strickland had mentioned earlier in the video. So let's take a minute to calculate this area. I also want to look at the circumference to see how far around this, this uh, ball turns around the toy. So let's take a look at both of those calculations. Okay, so if we were to calculate the area of this toy to see how much space Marley needs, we would go to that formula that Mr. Strickland had mentioned earlier, which is pi r squared. Now remember we had measured that our diameter was 15 inches, so the radius must be half of that, so from the center to the end of the toy. So that would end up being 7.5 inches or seven and a half inches. So if I were to use that in this formula, I would have pi times 7.5 inches squared. If I square that quantity, that would end up giving me pi times 56.25 inches squared now. So notice the square goes from being outside to just being inside with the inches because I've already squared the number. So now when I look at this, I'd probably rewrite it with the number out in front to be the coefficient. So 56.25 pi inches squared. So that would be the exact area of the toy. If I were to calculate the pi with it to get an approximate area, then I could say that this is approximately equal to 176 point, well, we can say 71 inches squared. So exact area before I multiply in the pi, if I multiply by 3.14159, then I would end up with this approximate area. So now we know how much area Marley needs for that toy. If I were to look at the circumference to see where that ball is traveling around the toy, this would be an approximate circumference because, of course, to get a more exact circumference, I'd have to measure from the center of the toy 
to the actual center of the ball that's rolling around. And we measured all the way to the end of the toy. So this circumference is going to be an over approximation just a little bit. So um, again, thinking back on the formula that we've learned for circumference, it is 2 pi r. So something to take note of, both area and circumference have the radius in them. However, this one is not squared because it is not an area. Another circumference formula that people have used before is um, diameter times pi. And that's because two of the radii really is one of the diameter. So this is another version that some people have learned in the past. Um, if I stuck with 2 pi r, since that's probably more familiar to us, we can start by plugging in. So 2 pi times 7.5 inches. Again, we said two of those 7.5 inch radii would end up giving me one diameter, which is 15 pi inches. And then again, if I were to multiply that by pi, I would end up with about 47.12. So here's the exact circumference. The approximate would be about 47.12 inches. So those would be the two calculations we could do. This could be an example of what you could submit for your assignment um, this week is just identifying circles in your house, calculating the area, calculating the circumference. You can um, go on to find tangents, etc. So different things that you can do with this week's assignment. These circles up next to that sheep's mask are the kinds of circles that you would do like needlework with. And if I wanted to do needlework with them, say that smaller one, uh, the area of the circle would represent how much fabric I would need to have to go inside of it. So if the diameter is, I'll just approximate the center of the circle is about there. So the diameter is about 13 inches. So 13 inches, I can start to do some calculations. Um, half of 13 would be 6.5. Here's my calculator. Half of 13 is 6.5. So that's the radius. And the area is going to be pi times the radius squared. So there is... 132.7, so it's around 132, 133 square inches of material is how much material will be inside that circle. So if I want to stitch it all and do some um, stitching in there, that's going to be a lot of stitches. And I'm sure if I had some rate at how fast I stitch things, I could figure out how long it's going to take me to fill up that circle. So lots of things you can figure out. Go math. Here's the view looking at my front door, and notice, oh, I must be a geometry teacher. Hey, that's Patty in the mirror. Say hi, Patty. Hello. I like shapes, Patty likes shapes. We've got the triangular mirror here, and all the circles. See, none of them are concentric. They all intersect each other. So some of them in two spots, like this one. These two circles are tangent to each other, so this would be a tangent circle instead of a tangent line. None of the others are tangent. All the other ones are intersecting, so they intersect at two places each. If they only intersect at one place, they'd be tangent circles. We could even go so far as to say that this handle here on my bathroom shower is a radius. Hello, all. I'm here to demonstrate tangents to circles on these two circles. Imagine this is going around the bottom of this is a circle around a plane that's also on the plane of the countertop. And there's another circle going around here. So this is a circle on this plane. It's also a cylinder coming up off the plane in three dimensions, but in two dimensions, it's a, it's a the cross section of it would be a circle. So you have two circles and this line touches them both. Touches that one there and touches that one there. So this line is a tangent to both circles. So it's called a common tangent if it's tangent to both circles, but you can focus on the word tangent. This line also, going the other way, I had it this way a minute ago, this other line here is also a tangent to the two circles. 
And then we have two of them that don't go through the, between them also. We have that tangent, and on the other side, that tangent. So we have four different lines that are tangent to both of these circles that are common tangents. Two of them are interior common tangents and two of them are exterior common tangents. Remember, the tangent is the word of the day here, and the reason this is tangent to this circle is because it only hits in one spot, and it's tangent to this circle because it only hits in one spot, and that's it.